uh, if you remember last week, I said that this, uh, it's a really diverse collection. Um, and I'm, I'm sure many of you are aware of it, but just in case you're not, it is incredibly diverse, this collection of poetry and songs that have been given to us and gifted to us, um, written in different times. I think, this is, I think it's important. I hope you think it's important. <laughs> Because, uh, or you'll get bored of me keeping on saying it over and again and again. But it's written over different times. So the Psalter, the word for the, this collection of Psalms, has been put together over hundreds of years. So right to the time of the David's reign, King David's rule, in around 1000 BC, right up to post-exile, to whenever the, the children of Israel were freed um, around 500 and Psalms in around that time. So we're, we're, we're talking about a 600 year period that this, is, um, that this has been penned over. And again, if you don't mind me, just like quickly going over the structure of this, of this book, hoping that it doesn't bore you completely. But I think it's really important that uh, there, there are individual Psalms that we, can, that we can pull out for our own, our own help, our own benefit, our own devotional journey. I think it's also important to know that these, this has been edited, this has been structured really purposefully. And so the, it's been structured into five, five books that will, that will be clear, if, depending on what version you have. You'll be told that book one is Psalm 1 to 41, and book two is 42 to 70 something, 70 something to 100. And, um, but the first book is mostly around David's reign, King David's reign. The second book is around that transition of power from David to, to his son and to those that came after him. Um, book three is almost the collapse of that. Uh, many, many painful psalms written in those, in that third book especially, uh, where the, the, king, the kingship just failed dramatically. And then book four is, is really Yahweh is the true king. Yahweh is the rightful ruler, true God, true king, it's, uh, this is how it should always have been. Um, and then the, the last book is, is, is written that people, everybody returning home, all people uh, returning home in the last few Psalms end with this crescendo of, of praise. Um, so that's what we, we talked about last week, written at different times by different writers, um, using different genres. We touched on those briefly. Uh, there's many different genres we could talk about. Uh, but we, I think we can condense them into um, thanksgiving, praise, and lament. Uh, make, up the bulk, make up the bulk of the, the, those, the, the psalms, those different genres. And they're addressing different needs in different contexts. Um, we're trying to communicate that, and I, and I think this is really true, that we can't reduce the entire message of this collection to one message. Um, as if each writer across all of these different times, using all these different genres, in different contexts, to different people with different needs, were all saying the same thing because I don't think they weren't, they were. I don't think they thought the same things. They, I don't think uh, that's what comes through as we read the, the Psalm as a collection. And I think that the, the reality is that neither do we. Like there's, we don't all think the same way, thankfully. We don't all uh, see things the same way, and, um, and so I think that's one of the beautiful things about this, this collection. The amount of metaphor that is used in, throughout the Psalter is, is another reminder to us that it is, that it is open to more than one interpretation. There is not one obvious meaning. And again, I think as we, we touched briefly on that last week around the parables that Jesus uses, Jesus uses parables, I think, because there's not, there's not one obvious meaning here. This is open to interpretation. This will speak to different people in different ways. And so this morning, uh, I've asked William just to, to, to share a favorite psalm. Um, I would love it. My preference would really be that if you have a, a favorite psalm that you would be willing to, to read, even if it's just to read it here on, on, over the next couple of weeks, if you're willing to read it, please let me know, because um, I am going to go and ask people. But it would be so much better if you came and said, "There's this, there's this psalm that like, that means so much 
that's maybe carried you through a difficult season, that's maybe been a, like a, a rock, a source, a source of foundation for you in, in times of challenge, if something like that you'd be willing to read and even just to share for a few minutes, um, please, please do that. Uh, I'd ask people to raise their hands last week who had a favourite psalm, and there was two or three hands went straight up, and so if you were one of those hands that went straight up and you know what your favourite psalm is, I'm thinking particularly of you. Um, so let, let me know, otherwise uh, I'll punch in you on a Friday. Friday, Friday, I let you know. I'd prepped him well before that, but Friday, I suppose, I confirmed. So William, come ahead and read us your psalm and, and talk to us a wee bit about that. So my favourite psalm is Psalm 133, which is maybe a little bit unusual, but um, it says a song of a sense of David, and it's only three verses, yeah? So it's not going to be very long. Uh, so one, Psalm 133 says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Uh, and I think brothers is used ger- there as general term, so it's more brothers, sisters, children, community. It is like, verse 2 then, it is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. And verse 3, it is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing life forevermore. So that's my favorite psalm. Perfect. And tell us why. <laughs> so <laughs> I suppose if, if you maybe reflect a little bit on what the psalm is, is only just three verses, and it's, it's ver- the first verse is really important. Um, it, it brings out something. It brings, I suppose, something of the heart of God really to us. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers and sisters and children to dwell together in unity, to live, to do life together in unity, to, 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 to love. There is affection there. There is something holding them together. It, it's not exactly that they're thinking the same thing on every little detail, but it's more, I think, about the, the, the quality of the atmosphere of that. So that, that's really summarized in the first verse. And then, like Neil said, the metaphors, verses 2 and 3 are used to just, by David, to try and emphasize how, 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 how pleasant that is, how, how joyful it is. It's something, you know, that fills the heart with joy and, and gladness to, to be. So it's, first of all, he likens it to the precious oil, which precious oil is something, it's an arrangement. The anointing oil is an arrangement that was actually set on by God himself. He had asked the, the priests and the high priests to, to make a blend of things together to put in the oil. Maybe the children can look into what that is. I can't remember so what I, it is. So you, sorry, yeah. you just stop here in your flow there. You were, but, but I think it's important because I was reflecting on that and then you mentioned it this morning briefly uh, and then I was just looking it up there and it's Exodus 30 that you're talking about. This yeah. um, Lord said to Moses, take the following fine spices. So he took myrrh how do we say that in Northern Ireland? That's, that's the right way to say it. A little myrrh and myrrh sound the same, don't they? Myrrh, myrrh spice, um, uh, cinnamon, cane, and cassia, um, and a hin of olive oil. Make these into a sacred anointing oil. There's another version that I was reading that said, blend these into a, a sacred anointing oil, a fragrant blend. The work of a perfumer, it will be the sacred anointing oil. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thanks yeah. for sharing that. And I, and I think what you say really connects with that point is that it's a mixture of things that God has set on. It's God that asked for it. And I think maybe those blend of things comes from maybe the church, from the community where you see different ones have different, I don't know what, maybe it's wrong to say gifts, but, but, but certain characteristics you see. You see shades of Jesus in different persons, and just the blend of that provides something really pleasant and pleasurable. Yeah. See, I, well, I can't speak for everybody, but I don't think we get the, the significance of some of that, that stuff that went on around how intentional some of that stuff was in the Old Testament around, I know you're more passionate about this than I am, but like some of that, that anointing oil, the intentionality around that anointing oil is more significant than I think that we realize. Because yeah. reality is it could have just been, if, if it was just about the oil, they could have just got 
well, maybe, I, maybe that's wrong. They could have just got the olive oil and poured it down the, the, the head and the beard of Aaron. We could demonstrate this, couldn't we, this morning? Could have brought him arrow, but he shaved his all off. Um, but there was something about that, the blend, the mixture of it all, in the context of unity. It's whenever all the, all the fragrances, all of the mixture, all of the different smells and flavors among us are blended together that it gives off an even more beautiful fragrance, uh, more fragrant aroma that even Paul speaks about, I think, a wee bit in Second Corinthians. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I hope you have something for verse 3 as well. No, you keep going. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I suppose verse 3 then, it, it moves that, that picture, that beautiful picture of the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded, for there in that place, the Lord has commanded the blessing life forevermore. So there is blessing, there is, there is almost um, blessing and energy and, and, and power there. In, in that. And, and like if, for those who know the Middle East, Homero and some a few others know the Middle East, dew in the Middle East is really, really important because there's not much rain. Mm. So the dew of Hermon is really valuable. Um, it, it's worth a lot, it's, it's, it's really important. Um, so, uh, and I suppose, you know, just, just in, I don't have a huge amount to say, but I just feel that that condition of a good and pleasant living together must be Jesus focused. Uh, I think he's the magnet for that. He's the one that, he's the gathering point, the one that makes all the different shades of, whether it's his work in us or even things that we're going through sometimes and pressures that maybe pull us to him. I think he's the one that, it couldn't be, it couldn't be someone's charisma that gets us together, but it's not good, because it's not going to stand the test of time. It's not going to last very long. Sorry. It has to be Jesus himself. Yeah, so that's really good. Uh, so, so that's really helpful, actually, because I, and I think that's, that's almost what, what I was hoping we could, we could show, because the idea of metaphor is that there's not one obvious meaning. You'll read it, and you'll think something different because of your experience in the Middle East. Um, and probably the reality of what it was for the people at this time, Jew in a period in a place of dryness, would have been would have been a different picture yeah. than, than probably my. So my initial reaction to that verse was simply like Jew covering the mountain. So it was almost like the Jew that covered this large area sent me to and maybe I'm maybe I'm overstretching this, but it sent me straight to Jesus saying. Uh, you will know that they're my disciples by the love that they have for one another. So almost that walking in unity will, will like spread wider. It will cover a wider area. You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe, like, maybe I'm pulling at it differently, but that was, the, that was the thing that stirred in me. That, that Jew that fell in the mountain in the context of unity means whenever we live in that way, when we dwell together as brothers and sisters in unity, people will know that we're disciples by the love that we have for, another, for each other and that, that influence goes spreads wider and further covers a greater distance. You know, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's, that's great. And, and it, it doesn't really, just to emphasize that point, doesn't really say how good and pleasant it is for brothers and sisters who agree on every single thing. That does, it's not what it's, it's, I think it's suggestive of atmosphere, of affection, of Holy Spirit coming down. Yeah. And, and, and I, th I love you, what you say about the dew coming in and, and softening the ground. Mm. Uh, uh, softening the ground is so important because even for those who know about crops, if you put a crop in the ground, and even if the crop grows really well, and the ground is, is too hard, it's really hard to harvest it. The ground has to be soft to be able to, to bear fruit, to enjoy the fruit of the land. Okay. So, Robert. okay. That's really good. Sometimes I think, uh, maybe, maybe it's just being in, in church world and being in the church bubble at times that you're, you're at, like you're wondering what's the will of God? What's he, what's he doing next? What is it that he's, what's the next big thing? Or what's the next big shift or the next significant moment? And I think we can, it's, it's amazing how quickly we can move away from like, I think about what, what is the will of God? What is it the thing that makes him most happy? And it's this, I think. It's a wee bit of what we've, what we've been trying to share this morning. When his kids, when his, when his sons and daughters live together in unity. Not when they, as William has, has said, and that's, that's, the, that's the type of church, the type of community I want to be a part of, that even when you don't agree in everything, you still prefer one another. That's the, that's the type of people, Jesus-y people I want to be 
be around. And I think that is, we, we can be so after the next, the next moment that we can move away from this most foundational thing that what he desires more than anything is, that was his biggest prayer. And you, like we, John 17 is my, my go-to place. That's, that's the very heart of the Father that his sons and daughters dwell in unity. It was the very, it was the very longing it was the deepest desire of Jesus and the prayer, the prayer that he prayed before he was, before he was taken to the cross. And I, uh, I think it's just good for us to, to ground ourselves in that and uh, that that never becomes old or boring or not hugely significant to what it looks like to, to walk with Jesus. I want to I take just a, a few more minutes um, to share a, f- a few other probably more general thoughts, if that's okay. Um, Because I'm still, part of me's still been wondering over the last week, um, because there's certain ideas that I had for over the summer. I still don't don't know if I fully know. I hope we'll discover that over the next couple of weeks. I hope we'll get to to the end of July and be like, that's why we were going through the, the Psalms together. Still find myself asking why, and um, I'm hopefully some of what I want to share now will will help answer that a wee bit more. Um, but Walter Brueggemann, Walter Brueggemann's language is a theologian author who I deeply admire, and Walter Brueggemann um, uses creates this uh, really helpful framework, if we can call it that. Um, for how he engages with the Psalms. And he talks about our life of faith consists in moving with God in terms of, and then he talks about three things. He talks about being securely oriented, um, painfully disoriented, and surprisingly reoriented. Does that make sense? So that, that's, that's what he talks about, just our life in our life of faith our, our journey with God, um, he, he condenses it into these three areas. Securely oriented, painfully disoriented, surprisingly reoriented. And, um, and so he talked about, he mentioned the Psalms as being that place that, uh, that provide us a way to think about, um, way to th- this provides a way to think about the Psalms in relation to our, our life, our common human experience. And maybe this, is, maybe this is a bit personal, maybe this is just a bit more reflective of, of where I'm at. But I find myself, as I think about my, my moving in faith with God, as I think about my journey with God, as I think about where I'm probably most comfortable, um, probably most uh, like unhelpfully comfortable at times, is in this, the first place, the first, um, the first area that Brigham had talked about, um, being securely oriented and that sounds good that sounds really healthy that, that level of equilibrium of being steady of being well leveled like I probably think that that's I'm hoping I'm, I'm able to say this in the room without people nodding their heads in disagreement but I think that's where I am that's where I find myself most of the time in that, that sort of equilibrium steady um, being securely oriented the problem is, and I'm not saying this, to, not, this is not self-deprecating in any way, the problem in some ways is, is that's not very interesting. <laughs> it's, not, it's not very exciting. And as comfortable as I am in a place of steadiness and equilibrium, it is not, uh, it's not very interesting. And, the, and as I think about that, trying to engage with the Psalms, as I'm trying to like, relate to so many of the authors in the Psalter, I realize that that level of equilibrium does not produce powerful song or powerful poetry or deep prayer. My challenge is, and I hope I'm hope able to say this without being too provocative, but I think this sort of first level, I don't want to use level, this first area of life that Brueggemann talks about is the mood of much of um, middle class church. Um, this safe orientation. 
And so I'll, I'll go to places. My preference then will be to go to places like Psalm 37 or Psalm 145, which just are like, they're like Proverbs. They're like nice, true, helpful statements about who God is. And so when it comes to devotional life, that's, that's where I'm most comfortable. But the reality is that that does not speak to all that's going on in my head. It does not speak to all that's going on around me. It does not speak to all that's going on in the world. And in fact, it is, it is so, uh, it's such a minority of the, the, the makeup of the Psalter is in that place of safe orientation or secure orientation. It's not where, it's not where most of our heads are at. It's not where most of life is found. Um, actually made me think this week mum and dad were in mum and dad were in Spain and, and uh, looking for furniture for the drop in base as we talked about a wee bit last week um, and we're hoping that it's going to fill it's hoping they're going to be able to bring big teams into that place uh, into, that, into that house and so you're wanting to, to, to make wise decisions on what you buy and so, so dad was the furniture store and uh, Explain this to the store salesman. We want to, like, we want to make, get the beds, the furniture that will make uh, allow for as many people as possible. And the furniture salesman showed him this sofa and said, "This sofa will sit five people without any problems." And Dad said, "Where am I going to find five people without any problems?" Um, this, this minor, this, this uh, area that I'm talking about where I find myself in, I think it's a, it's a, it's a minor theme in the Psalms because the, the majority of the Psalms, the majority of what we read, if we're fully engaging with this, do not come from a place of equilibrium, do not come from a place of being well settled. So the challenge for me as I think about myself is, I'm, it's not that I'm going to leave here today and go looking for going to look purposely for ways to intentionally unshake my equilibrium. But the, but the reality is, is that people are uh, driven to prayer. People are driven to song. Are driven to even something of what we sang in that last psalm where deep cries out to deep. People are driven to that place because of their experiences of disorientation. Their experiences of dislocation. Um, or of even of reorientation. Um, that's why I think this is important. I hope this is, I really hope this is coming across because in, in most areas of life, I think, and maybe I'm wrong, and I actually hope that I'm wrong, but in most areas of life, and almost embarrassingly so at times, especially in the church, we are expected to speak the language of secure orientation. We're expected to speak the language of equilibrium and well settled. That's the language we're supposed to, that we're expected to speak. Even in, it, 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 it's in our workplaces, it's, it could even be in our families, it could even be in our marriages. We're expected to speak that language. We're expected to put on that front. We're expected to put on that face where everything is settled, that everything is easy, that everything is okay. And the thing is, is that those, the rawness of life, like the raw edges of disorientation, the raw edges of when everything is not sitting right in your head, when everything is not well settled in your world or the world around you, but, and it's, it's denied, it's not good, it's not wise, it's not healthy, whenever those raw edges are denied or they're suppressed. And I want to be part of just the, the most raw, beautiful, authentic community. That's the type of people I want to be around. It's the type of thing I want to be a part of leading. Um, and so the thought of, 
of, of trying to smooth those raw edges to, that, that would deny, that would suppress, that would keep face. They would almost have this fake it till you make it attitude. Like just keep faking it until, <laughs> until like you believe it or until you're, you get to the other side of this dislocation or this period of disorientation. And so I, I, that maybe does not feel too exciting. And, and, and I hope, like, some of these times we've come together to praise and to worship, and I know that, um, for us to feel good. And, and, I, and I hope this doesn't make us not feel good, but I, but I do think it's something that I'd love us to talk about next week. I think that'll be, maybe that'll be, the, without putting any pressure on anybody, that, that'll be the proof of whether this is, <laughs> whether, we're, whether we're onto the right thing or not, or whether we've just missed this. Um, but I want to speak a wee bit more about that next week, this idea of disorientation. Um, because the reality is that if we're going to engage with the Psalms, that's what we're going to have to engage with. The bulk of, the bulk of it is around this lament, disorientation, and I want to speak to it. And I would love it that there'd be a freedom for us in our, in our marriages, in our relationships, in our friendships, that we would no longer feel the need to be expected to speak the language of security and equilibrium, a well settled if that's not where our heads and our hearts are at. So entering, if we're going to truly enter into the Psalms, I think this is what I'm, this is what I finish with and this is what I think I've discovered over the last couple of weeks. That is we, the entry into the Psalms, if we're going to do it well and right, it, uh, it's asking us to depart from the closely managed, and again, I think this was Brueggemann's language, it's asking us to depart from the closely managed world of public survival to move into the open, frightening, healing world of speech with the Holy One. And I think that's what, that's what we're wanting to do. Entering into this book, we're going to do it again over the next couple of weeks, it's asking us to depart from the closely managed, scripted, uh, manicured world of public survival to move into this open and it is frightening so much of what the psalmists are writing here is, 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 is provocative it is provoking but it is the open frightening and it's a healing it's a healing world of speech with the Holy One um, so I hope that is I hope that's okay that's what we're going to do um, a wee bit next week mixed in with praise and thanksgiving for one another, mixed in with good coffee. We would have had good buns, but mum's not going to make them again next week. Uh, but they're still there this week. Um, let me pray for us. And uh, Father, thank you, for, um, thank you for today. Thank you for this incredible group of people. Thank you for the gift that they are to, to one another, to the family, to this community, to the places that they live, to the places that they work. Jesus, thank you for what you've done and what you're doing in the hearts and the minds and the circumstances of each person in this room. Father, thank you that you're always at work. Thank you that you're working. Um, and Jesus, I pray that we don't miss we don't miss what you're doing or what you're saying or what you're inviting us into because of because of communication with one another or more importantly communication with you that is that is dishonest, that is not where we're at, that is not offering you all the deepest, painful, most hurting, angry, frustrated parts of ourselves. And Mr. Jesus, I pray that we would find ourselves this week in a place of um, God healing and hope. God, I thank you that even in those places of deep lament, God, that it is, um, it is never removed from a people clinging to hope. And God, I just pray for some of us in the room that, that it would be hope hope would really sustain us this week. Even with, uh, even with, as we begin to express those raw edges, God, I pray that you would, 
that you would allow us to cling to hope. And so Jesus, be with us as throughout today. Bless us, unite us, God, we pray. Yeah, as much as anything, God, that you would unite us. So we recognize that that is pleasing to you. We recognize that is what you're, that is what you're after. Brothers and sisters loving and living together, serving one another, recognizing that we belong to one another. And so God, I pray that we live that way for your, for your honor, for your glory, for the spread and the fame of your name. King Jesus, we pray. Amen.